And we are in, uh, we actually are closing the series uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. I certainly hope you've uh, appreciated it and enjoyed it. We've had some great conversations that have happened, um, led to some great discussions uh, about the last several weeks, especially when it comes to uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And whether it's, you know, you can read a lot of commentaries. Was it, was it one talk that lasted, you know, 30 minutes? Uh, was it, um, you know, how did, it, how did it look when it happened? If you watch The Chosen, The Chosen has some great uh, clips uh, in a couple of episodes where it shows them kind of preparing for the Sermon on the Mount, if you guys all are fans of The Chosen. Well, I thought about showing some of it, but we have some copyright things we didn't want to work around. So uh, you can watch that on your own. Uh, but it's got some funny dialogue between the guy who plays Matthew and Jesus and, and uh, you know, what, how do you prepare for it in the actual sermon. It's kind of a cool, again, very artistic, very uh, beautiful uh, rendition of it. But, you know, when you read commentaries, you know, was it several things that he talked about over a long period of time? Was it one thing? All we know is that Matthew records it this way for us as kind of a beginning to end, start to conclusion, uh, and that's a very well-known kind of concise sermon uh, that they call Sermon on the Mount. So uh, even though it covered lots of stuff, and that's what we've done over the last few weeks, hopefully uh, it has made sense to connect the dots because there are dots to connect uh, when it comes to uh, this particular passage. So I'll give you a re- really quick recap. All right? Sermon on the Mount is covered in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew, his recording there. It started off with the Beatitudes, is what we call it. Um, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who um, are peacemakers. These are the the Beatitudes. And really what we saw was this idea of Jesus kind of starting off, talking about what a blessed life looks like. What What does blessing look like? Not the way sometimes we talk about blessing, but joy. Happiness is really the, the word that he was using. Happy are those, fulfilled are those, joyful are those who do these things. And the promise, there's always a, a practice and a promise. So we kind of saw the first week that that, um, that you sow and reap your way to happiness. Happiness is not, and blessing, it's not like a state of being that we operate from. It's a place that we kind of work. We do the things he's called us to do in order to receive the things he's called that he wants us to receive. We sort of sow and reap our way to this life, this happiness or this blessed life, blessed, as many times we referred to the uh, the Beatitudes, this blessed life, all right? In the next week, Pastor Chris walked us through several examples where Jesus talked about, I mean, just a variety of things about our behavior and kind of opened up the heart to how much more important was the heart of the matter versus just the behavior itself. And so you, you heard a lot of that. You've heard it said this, but I tell you this. And there was a list of things, the law, um, lust, anger, divorce, the way we make vows or revenge or how we love our enemies. This is all this like kind of smattering, if you will, of different things But it all had to do with this idea that our behavior matters, but the why behind our behavior matters, right? The heart behind it really does matter. And then in chapter 6, it continues, not just with the heart of why we do what we do matters, but the sincerity of how we do things, especially when we we do things publicly. Uh, There's some things that you could do do publicly that honestly could just be done privately in terms of sincerity of what you're doing. And he gave three examples of like giving and prayer and fasting. And he was like, don't give with the pomp and circumstance that, you know, sometimes people do. Don't pray in Babylon and use a bunch of words that people don't use normal day life, like propitiation and all sorts of other things, right? Like don't, don't try to pull out your King James just to pray, right? Your King James, like, like, like these are the things that like, you know, go in the closet, close the door, right? He teaches us in that moment how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, right? Hallowed be your name. And then he goes into this next section, which I call our relationship oftentimes with, with between God and some of the things of this world. And, and so he hits three things. And in the last part of chapter six, he starts with this worry or trusting in God. I call it kind of God's relationship, our relationship with God and money. And he starts here in six. That's why we're going to recap it. Okay. So go to chapter six, verse 24. I'm going to recap by reading this because I think it sets us up for chapter seven. And as we move our way to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Here's verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate 
one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to drink or enough clothes to wear. Is it life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you, more far, aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. That kind of encapsulates sort of just this beginning, I call it the beginning of this section where he really wants us not just to trust him, but the reality is, is that what oftentimes happens is that people tend to equate behavior with righteousness. They, they tend to equate behavior with, with sort of how holy you might be or how holy you are. And the problem is, is that as he was talking about prayer and, you know, fasting and, and giving, he's like, don't do all those things just for show. He says, you know, when, you, when your heart is enslaved to money, because you're so worried about what, you know, what you're going to eat or drink or where, like, that's all going to reveal itself. He says, I want you to trust in God, trust in your heavenly father. I love when he says, you know, the unbelievers have no choice but to worry about these things. But he says, you already have a heavenly father who knows what you need. And then he moves out of this sort of relationship with God and money. And he moves into this section, again, chapter 6 into chapter 7, moves us from this relationship with God and money. And then he moves into uh, the relationship with God and our neighbors, right? God and, and, and each other, if you will. And then he caps it off with the golden rule. So we're going to really quickly read read through those, starting in chapter 7, if you want to follow along, since you're already there. Here's where we start in chapter 7. We continue what Pastor Mike talked about with the lens, that fuzzy lens that we can sometimes get where Jesus brings clarity to us. He says, do not judge others, and you will not be judged. He says, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use, and he's used this a few different times in the Gospels, just to help you understand, the standard you use means the measuring stick you use, the the weight determination you use, is going to be the same standard by which you will be judged. So he's basically saying how you judge others, the measure, the weight, uh, that kind of thing, that's going to be the standard that is judged, you're going to be judged by. And he says, you, why worry? about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own. And how can you think of saying to your friend, hey, let me help you get that log or that speck out of your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Keep going, sorry. Oh, that was really cool. All right, hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck. In your friend's eye. Keep going. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs because they will trample the pearls and then turn and attack you. We're going to pause here. But this is, this again comes back to where, again, when we, we tend to view and equate righteousness with behavior, especially that stuff that's showy, right? We will tend, we tend to get really self-righteous and judge and criticize others. We get really quick to condemn, right? We get really quick to condemn others and feel superior uh, to them. And I'll be, I'll be honest, this week was just sort of one of those just classic weeks of where I was seeing it so much online 
uh, especially before the election and after the election. You know I me, mean, we don't talk politics in here, but, but let's just be honest. If you were on social media like I was, I, you know, I saw it all over the place. And by the way, it's not you. I know all of you guys. You know, we're talking about other people today. Um, but, you know, you'd see these people and they'd be like, hey, if you vote for this person, like you hate God and everything that he loves, Right. Or after the election, God, my Lord, if you voted for this person, God, have mercy on your soul. You're going, you got the express path to hell, you know. Um, and, and, and when you see that, you see the, the, the foolishness of those statements. The, the, I continue to go back and just like, it, it's, it's coming from such a place of, of either true ignorance, because I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. It comes from a place of true ignorance or the most pseudo-righteous, self-righteous people in the world right? Like it, it tends to be either or. They, do, they don't know what they're saying or the reality is they're so full of themselves they cannot see past what they're saying. Do you really want to be judged by God by who you voted for Tuesday? Seriously? And again, if you say yes to that, you are extraordinarily foolish if you want that to be the measure by which you're judged, and yet this stuff gets put out there. And so, again, this is I, you, not journey. You guys are amazing. So all the other people out there, we're talking to you. No, I mean, that is just foolishness. Jesus makes it so incredibly clear. And by the way, Jesus tells us a little bit later on in the sermon, you're going to know very clearly where you stand before God. And it's not going to be who you voted for on Tuesday. And it's not going to be some other weird sort of self-man-made litmus test that we've come up with. It's going to be, it's going to be very clear for you who you've put your trust in. And so I say all that to say this is is one of the dangers and why it is he brings all this up in in the end of chapter 5 and all through chapter 6 and the beginning of 7, that we have to be extraordinarily careful that we do not allow this self-righteousness to creep into us. Us who, who should know more than anyone how depraved and condemned we actually are and how much we need the grace of God. You know, that's, that's who the followers of Christ should be. The ones that know that we're the chief of sinners. Know how much we need Jesus. He continues on in the heart of chapter 6. He continues on this idea of what does it mean to seek him? What does it mean to put him above all else? And he says these words. He says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking. And, you, and the door will be open to you. He says, for everyone who asks, receive, and everyone who seeks, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? He says, or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of, of course not. That's Jesus kind of answering the question for you. If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give you good gifts to those who ask him? This is, by the way, not a recipe for kind of a name and claim it religion. We'll just ask and you get it. He's talking specifically about pursuing God above all things. How do you pursue God? Well, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Why? Because if we as sinful humans know what it's a fraction of it is like to love our children well? You don't think the heavenly father that you have knows what to give you and knows what you need? That's really where he's coming from. And then he takes kind of a a point to cap this. He says, this is the golden rule piece. He says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Kind of similar to the first part with the judging and the, the measure by which we judge. No, do to others what you would have them do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. He actually is referring to a section where he taught at the beginning of the sermon, back in Matthew 5, where he was basically trying to help understand with the law, because the law was one of the first things he sort of pulled out. He said the law was created to help us understand our dependence on God, not to create religious systems and loopholes that we would try to get there and control it on our own. Right? He says, no, everything, even the law and the prophets, even the Old Testament was just there to point us to our need for God, our need for Jesus. And Jesus says, yeah, even if you use this, just this basic golden rule, this basic measurement, oh, how the world would be different to treat others the way you would want to be treated. 
Matter of fact, this is how he says it again, and, and this is again the, earlier in the sermon on the mount. He says, don't misunderstand why I've come. I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purposes. When Jesus tells them, you know, uh, when they asked him what was the most important commands of the Old Testament, he pulls from Deuteronomy and he says, fine, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, again, this is just his way of saying, if you just saw the heart of what God meant for, through these prophets, he wanted it to draw you closer to him, not closer to some system or some law to try to figure it out on your own. That's not why the law was given. The law was given for freedom. So here you see kind of the end of the, what we call the body of the sermon. You get to the end of this part where he's like, you know, we're going to, well, your behavior does matter. The heart behind your behavior matters. The sincerity by which, even if it's behind the scenes and you don't know, like anybody doesn't really know what you gave or what you did or you're fasting or you're praying, even when people don't know, don't let it be pompous. Don't let it ruin you into being self-righteous and judging others. Don't let it go that way. Continue to seek him above all else. Knock, ask, seek. You will find. And then he caps this off with the golden rule. And then he begins what, what, what is really the conclusion of his message. He begins this part of the conclusion of, of the Sermon on the Mountain. Like most pastors like me, usually our conclusion is, you know, fairly short. We try to keep it like one main point or one thing or maybe one story. Um, we begin the conclusion, and Jesus actually is going to tell three illustrations. Okay, But again, I want you to see the theme in all three of these illustrations, but he's going to give the conclusion to the entire message through these three illustrations that he gives. Uh, and it's kind of, you, you'll get the theme here. There are two gates, there are two trees, there are two houses, Right? You can tell that it's, it's, Jesus always made it very clear it's one or the other. There's no third option, right? There's no A, B, and C. You either love God or you're enslaved to money. You, you know, it's like he constantly clarifies two gates, two houses, or two, two trees, two houses. Let's, let's walk through these as he walks to his conclusion. Two gates is actually quite simple. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and the gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. If you would just leave that up for me, uh, Wendy, just leave that verse up. I want people to see it. The reality is, is this is again, this is one of those things that we get lost a little bit in our Western culture. Um, we like majority culture, right? Why do we like majority culture things? We like majority culture things because it makes it easier for us, right? That's why Christian, uh, uh, cons- uh, what, what, sorry, cultural Christianity is nice. It's nice to legislate morality. It's nice. We we, we say it's because we want everybody to have good things and, and bless the world. But the reality is, it's just easier for us. If everybody sort of behaves by the same set of somewhat rules, it's easier for us. But the reality is this. We are a minority movement. Always have been. The people of God, the the way of God has always been a minority movement. It's always been countercultural. Always. Right? Even when it was the majority and it rose to the majority movement in the Roman Empire, very quickly did the wheels fall off because it began to act like the majority, because the majority became more important than actually following Jesus. Same thing with the, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It became about positions and power. So you have to understand that Jesus is kind of just basically saying, look, the reality is that culture and the majority of people are going to choose themselves. That's just the way it is. And, 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 and it heart, it's heartbreaking for followers of Christ because once you taste and see the goodness of God, you want other people to taste and see the goodness of God part of the thing that fuels us as we share our faith. We want people to taste and see the goodness of God. But the reality is is that Jesus says, look, few are going to find it. Why? Because it's difficult. Because in order to receive life, you have to layers down. In order to receive the gateway to life, you have to lose your life is what Jesus would say. You have to deny yourself. 
You have to, you don't, it's not being true to yourself. You deny yourself. It, it's taking up your cross, right? And it's why it's narrow. It's why it's going to always be the few that actually find it, these two gates. And when he, and when he says that, you saw the word, like it's going to be those who choose to do that. It's not because they don't know the gates available to them, but they're going to choose their way. They're going to choose their path. And then it's interesting because he goes from talking about there's only two ways, right? There's this way and that way. He goes right into an example when he talks about the two trees, why does he give the two tree example? He says, he starts with this, I want you to beware of false prophets. I want you to beware of people who tell you there's a third way. I want you to beware of people who tell you that the ways don't matter. Everybody with me? Like this is the reason he says, no, no, no. The, the way matters. There's going to be the large majority way. There's going to be the narrow way and few will find it because it's more difficult. He says, and I want you to beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but they really are vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Again, Jesus is just bringing clarity. By the way they act, their behavior, right? They, 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 can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produ produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit, what? It gets chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And I love the clarity by which Jesus brings this to us, but we have to go back to the first part of the verse to really, really kind of see the fullness of it, okay? So uh, you can identify a tree by its fruit. Did you know that all flowering trees have fruit? Did you know that? Even if they're not fruit trees, they, they consider to have fruit. So it, it's the fall. This is common in North Carolina. How many of you guys already this year have gone to the orchard? You've already gone to pick some of these. Yeah, some of you? Right? The rest of us are waiting until it gets under 50 degrees. I understand. I understand completely. Okay. Um, so this is, what kind, what kind of tree does an apple come from? Yeah, you can say it's not a trick question. It's not, okay. What kind of a tree does an apple come from? Yeah, it's an apple tree, right? Uh, well, what kind of a tree does a banana come from? Yeah, I said that the first service too, but then I was told that bananas come from bushes. So thanks for all the smarty McSmart smarts out there to ruin my illustration. We're just going to call it a tree for now, okay? Okay, bananas. All right, did you know, because how, how many of you guys know what this is? Right? Did you know that this is a fruit? This is considered a fruit. I call it the devil, okay? These spike balls come from sweet gum trees, okay? If you can't see it, I'm trying to hold it. I mean, I've already knocked most of the spikes off it, but these spike balls come from the sweet gum tree. Now, I'll give you, you know, if you go to Google or, you, go, you know, they, there's some benefit to it and there's seeds for the little birdies and the chipmunks and, and they, the trees go fast and there's some medicine that are produced and blah, 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 blah. These are Satan's children. <laughs> okay? I, I, my yard is covered with these. You know, you can't burn these. You can't burn them. You can't shoot them with a shotgun. You can't do anything to these things. So I'm using, the, I, even though I know it's, uh, it's not bad, I'm going to use this as an example. Wouldn't it be great if Jesus' example here were this clear in everyday life, right? It's a good tree. Oh, it's a bad tree, right? It's a good tree. It's evil, right? Wouldn't it be great? And yet we have to go back to that first verse. He says, no, 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 no. He says, you got to understand most of them show up like this. Even the wolves show up like this. So you have to discern. You have to be aware. You don't, it doesn't oftentimes show up as clearly as it, you think it would, right? This, the bad fruit from the bad tree. You have to go, well, what is it really a banana? You know, and there's ways to tell, you know, you're like, well, it looks like a banana, but there's got to be more, right? You can open it up and you can say, oh, it looks like a banana still, right? You can smell it. You guys can already smell it. We put this in everything, right? You can taste it. It tastes like a banana, Right? There are ways for me to go through and prove 
that this is really, truly a banana. And I think Jesus is getting to the point of saying, look, you have to beware because sometimes it will show up and you think it's just going to be black and white, but it's not going to be because they will disguise themselves with their fruit. And for us, we have to be begin to acknowledge the fact that, okay, far too quickly am I just to, oh, he said the right things, he says he believes the right things, they say they are on the same page, but we don't do enough discerning and enough investigation for them to us to really know. What is in the wake of this person? What is in the wake of this ministry? Is it chaos? Is it broken relationships? Is it, is it deception? Or is there actual faithfulness? Is there the fruit of the gospel? in this person's life. Does that make sense? This is the reason Jesus is saying it. And then, and then believe it or not, again, he gives, three, he gives three illustrations, okay? So again, fruit is the evidence of the tree. That's what we gotta know. But he gives three illustrations, but he pulls out after this second illustration, and he doesn't give an illustration. He gives us a foretelling of something that's gonna happen that he, he believes is important to know right here in the middle of this conclusion, okay? There are two ways, and there are, be, and there are people that are going to try to come and deceive you, and then he says this. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we even performed miracles, many miracles in your name. But I'm going to reply to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. This is a rough one because the reality is that when you read the Sermon on the Mount, there is so much grace and there is so much of a pointing of our need for Jesus and our, our, our ultimate, you know, his ultimate desire, which is to, to give you what you ultimately need as a loving, heavenly father. But he also wants us to understand that there is going to become a time, not just in the discerning of others, because that's what he talked about with the, with the tree and the fruit. There's going to be a time of the discerning of others, but at this moment, he wants you to discern it for yourself. Because the only one that's going to know whether you have a transformed heart is you and Jesus. That's it. You're the only ones that are actually going to know. And what he says here is that people who know about God are still not going to get in. Because they don't know Jesus. You can know about Jesus. You can go to church and you can say the right things. You can even partake and participate in the church. You saw them. They prophesied in his name, which means they said true things about Jesus. They saw fruit, if you will, of the gospel, of Jesus' ministry, because the gospel and Jesus are always going to produce fruit. It goes back to Isaiah 55 where it says, you know, the word of God comes down like water on the mountain and floods the valleys and goes into the earth and produces the seeds. And like God's word's always going to produce. But, you know, we're human. We're, we're, we, we're faulty. Like we will sometimes attribute fruit from the gospel or fruit from the name of Jesus. And we might attribute that to a person, you know, just on the outside looking in. But Jesus is giving us this statement to say, there will be people who know about me, but do not know me. And no one will know that except him and you. That's it. It's not going to get, it's not going to be who you voted for. It's not going to be some other litmus test of behavior or anything like that. It's going to be, did you put your trust and faith in him alone? Did you choose the narrow way? Did you deny yourself and above all things put him first? So he pulls out and gives us this foretelling. I don't don't think it's for fear. I think it's just for the gravity of the people listening to say, I understand that there's a choice to be made. And it's not to know about him. It is to know him. 
And then the last example. And this is the one that most people know, right? This is the one that's a little more famous because it's the very end of the end of the conclusion, right? He says this about the two houses. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, right? Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Through the rain, or though the rain comes in torrents, uh, in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching, hears my words, and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds their house on a sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. I'll share this quick example I shared in early service. There was one of our uh, A-team folks. He was, uh, they were getting ready to build a house in Mooresville area over towards the lake. And this is years ago. But uh, I just remember walking through as we were praying and meeting and talking about stuff. I was asking about how things were going. And it was very early in the process. And they just sold their home over in the Denver area. And were getting ready to move. And they, they did some testing on the land. You know, the testing and the percolating and the things. You obviously can tell I know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but they did all that stuff and it failed. And they were stuck. And they didn't know what to do. And so the engineers came along and said, well, the only way to build on this land is for you to basically build it on stilts. Have you ever been to the coast and see those, those houses built on tall, tiny, huge stilts up in the air? Well, this is basically going to be a bunch of telephone pole stilts, like 20 plus stilts that were going to be pile-drived into the ground until they reached the bedrock so that their house could safely be built on their property. And I just remember having that conversation because it was going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> like a lot more money than they were initially planning on spending and, and doing. And it was just like, boy, how tempting is it to go, we could just build it on the, we could just build it on the top. I mean, how, how often does the storm of the century come? Every century, right? And yet, obviously, they chose to build on the rock. And I look back at this, and I always think about that in this set of verses, because I'm just like, it doesn't mean it's easy, right? It doesn't mean it's easy. Matter of fact, in this case, and in most cases, the easiest thing to do is just build it on what's there, to build it on what's simple, to build it on what's the least going to cause the least amount of problems. And that sometimes is just the topsoil. It's, the, it's that stuff that, that when the rains come, it's going to remove it. We saw it in North Carolina during this last hurricane. I mean, roads washed away, not because of the road, but because of the soil, right? The soil so easily brushed and washed away and roads were gone. No, the, the work that's required to build on the rock, to dig down, to actually build on, Jesus says, my words. For those who hear these teachings, those who hear my words, and you put it into practice, you do what it says. Again, not easy. They are the ones who are considered wise, whose home, whose houses, whose faith, whose lives are built on a solid foundation. And then this is what Matthew does to close out chapter 7. He actually takes just a sentence or two and talks about the response of those listening to the sermon. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of the religious law. He taught with the real authority because he's Jesus, right? But you have to kind of look back and go, you know what? The system they were in was a system of rules and loopholes with, with people that were hypocritical in nature so it was just kind of an information exchange. They'd come to the temple, they'd hear the information, and they'd go their way. And let's be honest, that's what church can be for a lot of people because they don't really dig in to see what Jesus is saying to them. That can be church for, for many. 
But in this moment, they heard Jesus and they heard his heart. Why did Jesus have to give so many examples? Example after example after example after example of everything that they, they already knew and things that they were already accustomed to. Jesus could have, this was a six-sentence six sermon, right? I'm the only one that matters. I'm the only way that you're going to be happy. I'm the only way to God. You know, trust me before you trust anything else. Done, right? But he gives example after example because he says, not only does your behavior matter, guys, because they were already living lives. They were already, as Pastor Mike said last week, they were already fasting. They were already giving. They were already praying. It wasn't like the doing of these things were not being done. It was like, no, they were already doing those things. They were already obeying the law, but they'd lost the heart of why it mattered. The heart of God in the midst of those things. They weren't putting him first. They were filled with judgment and condemnation and self-righteousness because of how they were running God's religion, how they were running the law, trying to manage those things. And Jesus says, no, it's going to come down to a choice between what you want and what I say. And he gave those examples. There's even going to be people who know about God but do not know God that will suffer the consequences of eternity. There's going to be, that's going to happen. But for those who hear my words, who have ears to hear and want to build their house on the rock, go back to chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, you have the experience to be blessed. You have the experience to experience that blessed life. Jesus wants everyone, again, with ears to hear. With ears to hear is a very common phrase that Jesus would say. Because he knew they were going to listen. He was speaking. But he didn't know if they were going to hear it. He didn't know if they were actually going to do what he said. Put it into practice. Make the choice that they needed to make. And that's how he ends the Sermon on the Mount. Let's pray together this morning. Father God, I just come to you and I'm burdened by the fact that given such a clear, crystal clear choice at the end of Jesus' sermon, um, God, I, I just feel that burden to make sure the choice is given today. And so God, I just pray right now with our, our, this room and the people that I can see, the ones in the room, um, that if you are here today and you, um, you've never made the choice, to lay down your life. You've never made the choice to give your heart to Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to, to raise your hand and let us as a church pray with you and for you and walk you through that decision. So if you're here, and again, if, if and I'm not going to force it, but if you're here and that's a choice you want to make because you have not made that choice, I want to walk you through that. And those watching online can do the same. As a church, we're going to pray together with and for you, for those who raise their hand and those that are watching later. Jesus, we acknowledge that you are the Son of God, that you laid down your life for us. You took it back up on the third day to bring victory over death, hell, and the grave. And God, we want to put our trust in you above all else for our lives. We want to lay our lives down and, give, and, and, and take the life you have promised and receive that gift from you. Jesus, we can't do it on our own. We can't do our own way. There's no third option. But God, we want to we confess to you that we believe that you are the Son of God and that you are the only one who can offer us eternal life. And so we want to receive that gift today. And as a church, God, we pray, we all pray that you would give us the grace that we need, so desperately need, that you would give us the strength to make the choice to always, every day, choose the narrow path, choose the one that's more difficult, choose to do the right thing, even when, even when people can't tell that we're doing the right thing, even when no one sees it. God, that we do those things because we're putting your words into practice and God, putting your words into practice, you've already told us, brings us the life that you've promised. 
God, give us that, that, that wisdom today. Give us that power through your Holy Spirit today to make that choice every day. Do not allow us to walk out of here and continue to be foolish because we are no longer ignorant, God, if we have ears to hear what you have to say. Jesus, we pray all of this because of your precious name. Amen.